Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak on how left politics shapes India's democracy. And the overall title that has been given is Shadows of the Past and the Light of the Future. That's precisely the battle that we are waging today in the country. Are we going to be swallowed by the dark shadows of the past? Or are we moving towards the light of the future? And that is where left politics shapes is Indian democracy, is to take Indian democracy towards the future, which is bright and which is possible, and break from the shackles of the darkness of the past. Well, this I'll return to this, uh, this aspect later, but as far as democracy is concerned, what is democracy as far as the left perceives it? Democracy is not something where there's only the right to vote every five years and elect a new government. And maybe if you're permitted to ask some questions from the government, make the government accountable, but that is not democracy in the fuller sense. Democracy in its fullest sense is what is contained in our Indian constitution, where we guarantee, okay, where we guarantee, we guarantee liberty, equality, fraternity to all, and more importantly, we guarantee justice. Justice that is economic, social, and political. Now this encompasses the concept of democracy as far as we in India are concerned. Abraham Lincoln's definition of, of the people, by the people, for the people. Well, most of, many a time, decisions taken by the people are not necessarily for the people. Now, that is where the dichotomy that, that comes in is that whomever you get elected, is that government capable of enshrining, I mean, of implementing these guarantees that we have given in the Constitution? Recollect when Baba Sahib Ambedkar presented this draft constitution and recommended that this should be accepted by the Constituent Assembly, he gave a warning. And that warning was what? He said, we have laboriously built up a political structure, a political structure where we have given every person one vote and where Every vote has one value. The vote of everybody has the same value. But he's lamented, saying that we have not created a society where every person is of one value. We've only given the vote as one value, but not human beings as one value. And unless we overcome the socio-economic contradictions, that are present in our society at the earliest, this political edifice that we have created so laboriously will be blown asunder. This was the warning Dr. Ambedkar gave. And how left politics shapes Indian democracy is actually taking India towards meeting the challenge posed by Ambedkar and the warning that he gave all of us that these socio-economic inequalities will have to be overcome and only then Indian democracy can be mature. Now this is the direction in which the left propels Indian democracy to move. Today what do we have a situation with this inequality? What we have today is that 40.5% of the wealth generated in the last two years has been cornered by 1% of Indian population. That is your richest, 40.5%. The bottom 50% has a mere 3%. Now, instead of moving towards the maturation of this democracy, you are actually moving backwards. That is, we are getting swallowed by the shadows of the past. And that is what has to be resisted and to move forward. Now, this resistance is required also in terms of the other aspects of democracy that we spoke of, that is individual liberty. Today, you have one of your, uh, I mean, brethren, I mean, journalists from Kerala, 
after 28 months, walked out of jail yesterday. I'm talking of Kappan. 28 months he was kept in custody without a charge sheet properly being filed. And where is that liberty that you have promised, that anybody who speaks differently or dissents or opposes this government is actually jailed for that purpose? And you have the agencies that are used by the state and the government to actually persecute and prosecute individuals. In the last few years, since this government we had come in the center, there are nearly 6,000 cases that the enforcement department filed. 6,000. They have a penal, criminal provision whereby they can detain you or me, anybody, even without proving any charge or even framing a charge sheet. What is the conviction rate? In the courts, the conviction rate is less than 0.5%. 0.5% is the conviction rate. So your liberty that you are talking of, of individual liberty, is under assault. Then what you are talking of fraternity. Now you've seen situations where minorities, particularly the Muslim minority, is not merely targeted, but institutionalized. Mechanisms are being brought legally, creating new laws whereby this discrimination against them on the basis of their religion, this discrimination against them is actually growing. You had in, in schools and colleges now, targeting of Muslim children, Muslim students. You had that very, very notorious case in Mani, Manipal a, a month ago, where a Muslim student was called by the teacher saying that where do you get this terroristic mindset from? You know, this sort of a thing which actually is the, de I mean, demolition of your concept of fraternity. And now this is growing against the other minorities as well. That is the Christians in particular. You had that happening in, uh, in the Basar area, the Jharkhand recently. And this fraternity is also go being eroded. And then, Equality, fraternity, liberty, and then the question of justice. Justice means social justice as well. So the four fundamental tenets on which our constitution stands, these four fundamental tenets, that is liberty, equality, fraternity, and justice, these four fundamental tenets were converted into institutionalized mechanisms in the constitution which we have been following, that is, one, the objective of economic sovereignty, safeguarding that. Secondly, the objective of secular democracy. Thirdly, the objective of social justice, end to discrimination and end to the marginalized sections of the people. Fourthly, the question of fraternity between different linguistic communities and therefore the relations between the central government and the state governments, that is federalism. These are the four foundational pillars of our constitution. Secular democracy, economic sovereignty, social justice and federalism. Every single one of these, every single one of these is actually being assaulted today. We've had, in the past, big struggles to achieve, achieve these objectives. Because how the left shapes Indian democracy, actually the shaping has, had begun through the freedom struggle and the national movement. It was the big struggles against zamindari and landlordism, led by the left, whether it was the armed struggle in Telangana, whether it was Punna Pravailar, whether it was the Tebaga movement in Bengal, or the Surma Valley struggle in Assam, or the Varli tribals in Maharashtra. It's all these struggles that brought together the central issue onto the agenda of the national movement, that is land reforms. Once implemented these land reforms, even much, I mean, in a limited sense, 
They're not been fully implemented anywhere so far. But even in a limited sense that they were implemented, and that was also done mostly in the left rule states, this land reform led to a certain degree of moving forward in achieving the constitutional objectives. Or take, for that matter, the question of linguistic reorganization of states. It was this big movement of IK Kerala here, Samyukta Maharashtra in Maharashtra, Vishalandra in Andhra Pradesh, in all of which the communists played an important role, and that is why the political map of India, of the states that you find today based on, on languages, linguistic uh, reorganization, that took place. And mostly on the issue of secularism. And I can say it without any hesitation, that it is the left and left alone that today stands committed to the principle that secularism means the separation of religion from politics and from the state. It is our personal belief. I mean, I may have been born in a high caste Hindu family in Andhra Pradesh, Telugu speaking, but I've chosen to be an atheist and I've chosen to be a, a communist. You choose what you want to be, which is your religion. You should have that right and nobody has the right to interfere in that. And it is only the left that continues to practice this in principle. In practice, what have we seen? In practice, what we see today is secularism is reduced to saying equality of all religions. When this becomes the principle, the majority religion automatically has a dominant role to play. So it, until we separate religion from politics and we separate it from the state, secularism itself cannot be safeguarded and likewise democracy. That is why the term is always secular democracy. It is not secularism and democracy. But secular democracy is, if we have to safeguard that, these three aspects I'm giving you only as examples of how left shaped Indian democracy. But that's the past. Right now we are battling the shadows of the past. So, so let's not get into that past and rest with that. But how do we, how do we meet this challenge today? to ensure that the darkness of the past does not engulf us. And that, in order to understand that, I think we'll have to understand the long battle of uh, ideas or visions, let's say, that have been taking place in India through the freedom struggle, since the time of the freedom struggle. The basic question was, toward the earlier generation than mine also, the basic question was, what will be the character of independent India? How will you define India? Now, with all our diversities, with all our languages, with all our different cultures, faiths, traditions, etc., habits, with all these things, the only way in which this country could be kept united was, is through secular democracy or a secular democratic republic. That was the only political structure that would happen and that was embodied finally when Gandhiji gave the call for Purna Swaraj at the Karachi resolution. That concept was actually enshrined in our working of creating this sort of a new country and a new state. This was the vision then propounded by the, propagated by the leadership of the national movement led by the Congress. It's a different matter. I'll come to it soon after independence, how the Congress started betraying on, on all these promises that, that the freedom struggle achieved. But the left had another vision, distinct from the Congress vision. The left said that yes, it has to be a secular democratic republic, there's no other option, but it cannot stop there. The political independence that we gain from the British must be converted into the economic independence of every individual. And unless you convert that economic, convert it into economic independence, that secular democracy itself will be jeopardized. That secular democratic republic itself will be weakened if you don't move in that direction. 
<coughs> and that is the direction towards socialism. <coughs> so this was the left's alternate vision, which was then posed to the... Sorry. It was then posed, uh, posed in, during the national movement. But as opposed to this, there was a third vision. And this vision had twin brothers, let's say, or twin objectives. And that vision said, India must be defined by the religious affiliation of its people. Two variants emerged out of this, the twin expressions. And that is when the two nation theory was born. The first to articulate this was V.D. Savarkar, and who spoke of that, the, that there are two nations in India, one is a Muslim and another is a Hindu. And from that was born the concept of an Islamic Republic, which finally led to the partition and the formation of Pakistan. And then the slogan of Hindu Rashtra, or today the Hindu Rashtra, propagated by the RSS. Now this battle between these three visions is what is actually continuing today. If you have to understand why these shadows of the past are actually engulfing us, it is because this battle has not been decisively won by any side yet. And it is this battle that is continuing. That is where we all, all of us, are joining. Whether we want to join or not join, we are part of the struggle. And that is what we have to realize, that being part of the struggle means what? That the conversion of a secular democratic India into a, a fascistic Hindutva Rashtra, which is the RSS conception, would mean the destruction of this secular democratic republic and its foundations. So that is why today this assault on the constitution, that is why today the entire decrying of all the heroes of your national struggle, national movement, independence struggle, that is why today erasing of your history, history is a double-edged weapon. It can either inspire us or it can destroy us. And how we interpret history? Now, why is mythology so, so, so very powerful? Mythology is powerful because it gives an expression to a desire in people for things which they cannot realize in their actual lives. But that is not history. Eric Hobsbawm, one of the finest historians of the, the last century and the first two decades of this century, once wrote on why, what is the mythology and how mythology becomes history. The classic example is the concept of the city of David, Israel. He said before the Roman Empire, before the Roman Kingdom, etc., concept of cities or capital of, 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 of any group of people, such things never existed in history. It was created. It was created to perpetuate the myth that the Jews were all in one place at, one, at, at all points of time, that Jerusalem was the city of David, and it is from there, or city of Sol Solomon, we, you go back even past, and it is that mythology that sustains the state of Israel even today. So when he was asked, is it because of a, a human a collective memory of the people or the Jews. He said it's not a collective memory, but it becomes a collective memory because you are being told that this is the truth every day. So that is how mythology is actually cemented in people's consciousness. And that is precisely what we are facing today. We are being told day by day that this is the history that goes back 1200 years ago, we were a glorious kingdom then. In between has come this aberration of 1200 years from the Delhi Sultanate, and now we are back to that history. And therefore, rewriting your history books, distorting your, your history texts, and claiming unscientifically, ahistorically, a lot of facts 
which are not really facts. So this whole effort that is being done is to create, and this is an important point we have to understand, is to create a false consciousness. Create a false consciousness amongst the people of having a glorious Hindu past that was distorted by the Muslim, by later the Christian or the colonial rule, and these two have destroyed our glorious past, and that mythology is perpetuated through the creation of this false consciousness among the people. And if this creation of false consciousness has to be sustained, then it will have to be sustained by actually eliminating reason and rationality from thinking process. So there was this uh, famous uh, intellectual, George Lucas, many of you may have uh, uh, read his works, etc. He started writing, or I mean started examining a question. He, the question was what before him? He says, in the 19th century, Germany was the birthplace for the most rational philosophy. The most rational philosophy based on reason. That philosophy was born in Germany. You had Hegel, not only I mean, started from Hegel and the dialectics, and it continued through the 19th century. You had Marx, you had Hegel, you had various Kant, you had various other uh, you know, philosophers. Such a rich tradition based on reason and rationality. How did the people who were brought up in the legacy of this philosophy, how did they internalize Nazi fascism? What, what, what happened to these German people, inheritors of this rationality and reason? I mean, why did they em embrace Nazi and fascism, fascist philosophy. Remember, even in early 1950s, Hitler, in a popular vote that was taken in Germany, he reportedly have polled 54% five years after the war. He continued to remain a bad popular according to that survey. I don't know how authentic it is, that's a separate matter. But the question is, we got to answer this question, why? Why did the German people, you know, accept this, uh, this uh, fascistic philosophy, uh, I mean, right down from what Hitler was peddling to them? Lukas, finally, his work is published after the Second World War, and it's a book called The Destruction of Reason. It's now been translated into English. I would seriously recommend uh, all of us to read it, that this destruction of the reason, he explains that the method by which Nazi fascism succeeded in gripping the minds of the people and creating a false consciousness is by destroying reason, destroying rationality. And rationality, once you destroy and is replaced by irrationality, then blind faith becomes the basis of human survival and behavior. And that is why today, you open your television shows, I mean, you are, you are lucky in Kerala. I mean, whenever I come to Kerala, I think it's like an oasis in a desert, that coming from North India, when you come here, when is it entirely? We wish if Kerala can be like this, why can't the rest of India be like this? It's perfectly possible. But that's a different aspect, we'll come to that later. But, but you're lucky, but you see in, in Hindi now, the entire TV serial shows that are, that are posted every day. Every day, one episode or the other, the talks of superstition, the talks of uh, I mean, I mean, attacks on women, subjugation of women, secondary status for women, blind faith. And that is, and passing off your mythological stories as history. Every example that the Prime Minister of India today gives as history is from the 
रामायण और महाभारत एंड देन हाउ इज साइंस एंड साइंटिफिक टेम्पर बिन अटैक्ट इंस्टेड ऑफ सेइंग दिस इज ए दिस इज अ मैथोलॉजिकल स्टोरी सो मेनी रैशनल थिंग्स कैन बी एक्सेप्टेड इन यू नो इन इन वर्क ऑफ फिक्शन बट फॉर एग्जाम्पल इन महाभारत गंधारा gives birth to 10 male children the cover was 100 can a woman in one lifetime give birth to 10 100 male children without any female being born what did the prime minister say our science was so advanced that we had stem cell research those days and you had test tube babies that were produced now if this is what is peddled for you it's the your inquiry spirit of inquiry your rationality your reason i mean there's only one example you ganesha's thing all of you know i mean what all he said about it but this is exactly what is happening today that is why this new education policy that is why the revamping of your textbooks and that is why you have this entire attack on any rational discourse that is taking place with scientific temper part of the duties of the citizens prescribed by the constitution scientific temper is under assault and this is essential for them without assaulting scientific temper they can't create a false consciousness and this false consciousness is absolutely the bedrock of destruction of indian democracy as enshrined in our constitution and this is what fighting against that which is the left's uh, role which it is doing in that is what shapes indian democracy now what is the democracy and the content that we want the left says go back to at least assure what is said in the constitution so that we can go beyond to create a better india what they want is to go back into history into the darkness of the past and on that darkness there will be a bright future that will emerge that can darkness has to be fought with with the light in order to banish it so that is the role of the left lies in in actually carrying forward this battle to preserve what we have today so that we can change it for the better once we have safeguarded and preserved it and that is what can be and should be indian democracy and that is why i think combating apart from everything else when I mean, that is com- I mean, politically combating them socially combating them I mean, ideologically combating them culturally combating them but most importantly is to combat this effort to create this false consciousness which is also unfortunately which has already been created to a large extent to combat this false consciousness that that is being bombarded against us and that is something that can happen only on the basis of a scientific rational inquiry the spirit of that and that reasoning and that is what we'll have to carry it forward that is why as i said in this i'm so glad that the mathubhumi is organizing this sort of a event whereby we are able to discuss so many things even discussion is now becoming a rare rare thing in many parts of india instead of discussion you say you accept me if you don't accept me i'll beat you up that's all as simple as that so even discourse discussion rational uh, debate even that is being erased that is what they would want and this is i'm so glad that this is happening here and because i think the media has a very important role to play i mean in the mornings in north india you don't feel like opening a newspaper it will be full of you know i mean venomous hatred particularly your regional language uh, newspapers and this atmosphere of hate and poison this poisonous hate campaigns that are conducted where the media has a very big role to play or it's already playing a very big role in my opinion to large extent a negative role except for honorable exceptions and most of those honorable exceptions you will find in your state of kerala and you say please start 
editions outside of Kerala so that it can help us also and in other languages to at least combat this. Journalism and the newspapers and the media have a very important role to play in combating this. So the combating this the creation of this false consciousness. So therefore, finally, finally I would say the left politics is the one that today shapes Indian democracy in the direction of what was envisaged in the Indian constitution and for realizing that. It's often, the direction in the constitution is often referred to as the idea of India. The idea of India is that it was when it came out in the 1950, it was in that sense a big leap forward. Many of the Western democracies so-called today did not have, uh, I mean, universal suffrage. In 1950, we gave every Indian, I mean, man, woman, Brahmin, Dalit, Muslim, Hindu, Christian, every Indian the right to vote. And that was a revolutionary step at that time. And that's why when uh, Barack Obama came to give us a lecture in the parliament, when I was there in parliament once, so after the lecture, there's a normal custom. They, they we called, uh, there's a golden book in the parliament where the foreign uh, dignitaries inscribe something and sign. So Obama, I mean, the book is not golden at all. I mean, there's nothing else. <laughs> it is just a pure paper book, but it is called the golden book. And then Obama, they wrote, that uh, greetings from the world's oldest democracy to the world's largest democracy. It's a different matter. Modi today says we are the mother of democracies, but this is what Obama had uh, inscri inscribed in that uh, golden book. The bell for me to stop, is it? No? <laughs> I thought there was some Obama fan here who was getting upset. So Obama, when he wrote that, that evening, there was a banquet where they normally, customary, the president of India gives. So we were all invited. So when we were, I mean, shaking hands and meeting uh, with each other, so then he said, he briefly chats with uh, certain people, all foreign uh, dignitaries do that. So I said, sir, I think you have to recheck your facts. I don't think you are the oldest democracy. So he said, why? He looked at his wife, Michelle. He said, is that true? I said, the African-American population got the right to vote universally in 1962, a year after you were born, Obama was born. So to say that you are the oldest, we gave it from 1950s since the day India was born. And, and, and therefore, you are not the oldest democracy. So we, we've done all that. We, but then we have to preserve it. And that is where the role of those who had to preserve it in the initial years after independence, how each one of these promises were betrayed, and now the assault of the <coughs> fascistic uh, vision and the two-nation theory over the secular democratic vision of the secular democratic republic. These are the challenges today. So the left today shapes Indian democracy in a manner of today, realizing this idea of India, in realizing the ideals that we have enshrined in our constitution, so that on that basis, to move forward towards an egalitarian and an equal society, that is towards a socialistic objective. So that is the role that the left plays as far as shaping India's democracy is concerned. And that is where I think now the matter is no longer which is whether this is right or this is wrong. The question now is to save India today so that we can change it for the better tomorrow. So that is what I urge all of you already. Kerala is playing a very important role. Kerala means all of you are together. All of us are playing an important role in this direction. But that will have to be further consolidated. And that is my appeal to all of you. And thank you, Mantra Bhumi, for once again giving me this opportunity.